Right then, hello and welcome to what is take two, hopefully louder this time. I don't know what happened to the last one. Of World War Two, And this morning you have a double presenter team. Because someone has just wandered in. To say hello. As usual, never work with children or animals. In this case, never work with someone who has a bigger ego than your own. He's a poodle. The fluffy research assistant is here and is saying hello. Right, so. It's World War II. Flying boats. Seaplanes, mothered by capability or necessity. And it looks like I'm going to be controlling the mouse left-handed. So, if things go completely wrong, it's entirely on, on that. <laughs> right then. We have bilge pumps. Bilge pumps is a lot of fun. Bilge pumps includes two people with poodles. And, and Drac isn't one of them. We've got to work on him. Like, we've got to work on Jamie having Iron Brew. We've got to work on Drac having a poodle. Because, frankly, that would make us all three exactly the same. We'd all three have poodles. We'd all three drink Iron Brew. This is, um, this is our lifelong mission now. It works. It works. The poodle link works. Right then. Uh, hopefully he's going to be satisfied with my feet for the next few minutes. So that is going to make me sort of looking like I'm sort of lying down, relaxing. But actually it's because my feet are hard at work, keeping a very, very demanding puppy dog very happy. Right. He's come up this morning because he didn't like being downstairs. And so he was upstairs. So... Uh, let's see if I can get my notes up from yesterday. And the idea, at least the theory, is that because of the notes, I will be able to generate pretty much the same chatting away as I did yesterday. That's the idea. We will now see if this is true. <laughs> oh, we all know, won't we? We all know. That in this way, we can always dream of it. Hang on. Ah, oh, no, I wrote up the wrong one. Dang, Blasic. Give me a second. Now, I have the right one. I have a fluffy research assistant. Let's start. Oh, I don't know. It's one of those mornings already. It's kind of gets. Why is it quiet? Why is it so quiet? Right. So. that around a bit just to give me a little bit more camera space right. so 600 shit navy bilge pumps it is fun i do love bilge pumps the memes especially as i've said the memes are really good so what were they fought in world war ii well there's the battle atlantic and the battle pacific which i include the battle of the arctic and Mediterranean and everything else going on Flying boats, seaplanes are a massive necessity. They are really, really useful. They're really critical. They're long-range anti-submarine warfare escorts. They are flying porcupines in the case of the Sunderland. Um, they have so, uh, so many things going on. Now, the thing is, most of the aircraft involved are actually quite heavily involved are those ones I've already talked about in the interwar period. But there are still aircraft being developed in the World War II period, and it's interesting to see how they develop how the Sunderland is developed into another aircraft, what happens with the PBY line. It goes a bit weird, honestly. It goes a bit weird. And what comes out of them. Now, communication. There is also that. You have to remember the infrastructure that we talk about these days when we're talking about airports and airfields around the world was mostly built during World War II. For a large part of World War II, there wasn't, and even when there was, the aircraft were mostly being used as heavy bombers. So, for example, Winston Churchill makes the first transatlantic flight of a head of government. And some people do say head of state. He was the head of government. I'm sorry. There was a king. There was a king then. It's a queen now. The prime minister is head of government. Head of state is the monarch. So head of government, first transatlantic flight of a head of government. And uh, it's a border Sunderland. Huge flying boat. B-52 
because honestly it can land anywhere and will be safe you know it, if it has any issues it can touch down literally theoretically we wouldn't want it to actually touch down for too long in the middle of the Atlantic but theoretically it could land but it can land pretty much anywhere in water so that means that if the if you the Germans had managed to arrange fighters to manage to be in the right place to attack the Sunderland and actually had managed to injure the flying porcupine, um, they would have then been in a they, as long as it could re reach somewhere relatively calm water wise on the UK, it was landed and he was fine, he was ashore and safe. So it, would it gives you an extra level of security when you're moving. Now, the Sunderland wasn't enough. Basically, take the Sunderland, add in even more powerful engines, and give it a beautiful 20mm cannon dorsal turret. Okay, and you're going to have a fun night to party tonight. It really is a lot of fun. And the 0.5 Browning's turrets were big heavy hitters. The Seafoot is basically blasting capacity. And it's used far more for, in a way, for the transport of people, for the communication role, than it is for the anti-submarine warfare role. It's only 10 made. So they are pretty much flying VIP security trains. And they work really, really well. Um, let me put up my notes. The Seaford has a four Bristol Hercules. With which are 14 cylinder radial engines, each producing 1720 horsepower. That's a total horsepower. This aircraft carry has of 6880 horsepower. Imagine how fast my Super Impressor could do, go, go with that. It would probably keep the fluffy research assistant's hair fully back the whole time. Um, let's see, range. 2,700 nautical miles, which is darn good. Would have been quite useful as a search aircraft if they produce more, but the trouble is this one comes into service in 1944, and by the time it's properly in service, the RAF is sort of trying to wind down its long-range maritime patrol in terms of um, especially the flying boats, which are, there are issues with them in terms of if you prefer to have air bases, they are, your air bases inshore, they are very annoying, and also there is the fact that the Navy was making the point that they used flying boats uh, like the Supermarine Walrus, and um, perhaps they should have them and rather than let the Navy get involved in it in the politics battle that was going on at the time, uh, they got rid of them by, uh, by 1950s, which was really annoying, because they would have been really useful. Um, so... Then you have its guns, of course, the six fifty point five inch Browning machine guns, uh, two each in the nose, tail turrets, and two beam guns, and as I said, the two twenty mm cannon dorsal turret, and also two fixed three or three Browning machine guns. Not quite sure why the Browning fixed Brownings were necessary. With all that firepower, anyway, comes with the ability to carry. Two and a quarter tons of bombs and depth charges. Two and a quarter tons of bombs and depth charges. Frankly, that's going to be a massive nightmare for anyone. I know, fluffy researchers. They're trying to call you away, but you're being patted, aren't you? Oh, you're going to go. Okay. I feel spurned. That's cruelty. Ah, uh, well. Fluffy research assistant has gone off to be patted elsewhere. And we're on to the Supermarine Walrus. Now, the Supermarine Walrus is pretty cool because, A, it's designed by great R.J. Mitchell. And, B, it's designed with the same engine as the Swordfish. And, C... After the Spitfire, it's the most commonly produced submarine aircraft of World War II. I suppose if you count the Seafire as separate to the Spitfire, that might be it, but I don't. So it's the, as far as I know, it's the Submarine Walrus. 
And there are 740 of them made. And they're introduced in 1935. Their first flight is in 1933. They serve with the Royal Navy, the Irish Air Corps, the Royal Air Force, and the Royal Australian Air Force, and the Royal New Zealand Navy, and the Royal New Zealand Air Force. I do love the person who reminded me that they served the Irish Air Corps. I'd completely forgotten. Then went, then went and did some digging and found out, yes, they did. They were eventually able to be used on, well, they were the first aircraft with a really cool retractable undercarriage, which was one of RJ Mitchell's designs. Um, and it was very cool in terms of its ability to land on aircraft carriers, although that did take a while to work out. The fact that they used the same engine as the Swordfish was also a major advantage logistically, because instead of having to carry four engines of five different, each of five different types, you could carry 20 engines of one type. That's, you know, it's logistically, it makes better. So if you can consider, consider it, the same engine works for your torpedo aircraft, your spotter aircraft, your reconnaissance aircraft, and your amphibious reconnaissance aircraft. So that's four aircraft types. That's fun. And it works very well. It's very reliable. It isn't quite as long-ranged as the others, or even as its own um, swordfish counterpart, but it is fairly good. It's got a, a range of 520 nautical miles at cruise, and the cruising speed is about 92 miles an hour. I did. I, I found it interesting because some of the comments were going um, on previous versions. Going, cruising speed was usually around about 70 miles an hour. It seems to be that the cruising speed of around 70 miles an hour is definitely true of earlier ones, but once you're getting up to the higher uh, the, the World War II ones, uh, the cruising speed is migrating up towards 90. And there was even one type I read of which had a cruising speed of 100 miles an hour, which would be pretty cool to take on. But it's, you know, it's basically 80 knots is what their cruising speed is. And I prefer working in knots. Its guns were two 303 Vickers machine guns, one in the nose and one in behind the wings. I'm not really sure how well they, you know, they perform, but, you know, they got them. And it could carry six of the 100 pound bombs. Oh my lord. I still can't believe it. 100 pound bombs, come on! They're 45 kilograms for those who need to explain. Or two 250 pound bombs. Or two 250 pound Mark 8 depth charges. Woohoo! Finally! That's for far more advanced ages. And um, they have a power to mass ratio of 0 0.155. Hmm, that's cool. Now, what I love is that Supermarine, of course, have the Seagulls and the Sea Otters and so many aircraft, which have so many weird names. I, I like the Supermarine Walrus, but I do wonder about the naming. Seriously. Supermarine. Hit and miss when it comes to naming. Spitfire, very good. Walrus, sea otter, seagull, and there are some weirder ones on top of that. Why? What was on with you guys and your naming? Right then. America, the consolidated PBU-2Y Coronado and the Curtis CSE Seagull. Now, there's also someone, one interesting thing that's called the Seahawk which comes after it. Interesting enough, before we get into the Coronado, which we're going to discuss in this, I'm going to bring up the Seagull, okay? I'm going to bring up the fact that so many people spend their entire lives, especially on the internet, going, the only naval for only force in the world which was deploying biplanes in the world was the Royal Navy. No, it wasn't in World War II. Quite a lot of their services had biplanes. They were quite common in the late 1930s. Do you know why? Because they ha gave you a lot of lift. And a lot of lift is useful, especially when you're still developing powerful engines and you want to go long range on as little power as possible. Because the more powerful engines, use more fuel. So if you want to get long range, you need to carry a lot more fuel. You need the more lift to lift it up. Biplane. In the case of the Curtis Eagle, it served the right way through World War II to 1945. 
and it's the spotter aircraft for sh surface ships. Again, a role which the Sawfish was used for. The Sawfish was used as a, in its float plane configuration as the spotter from HMS Warspite and all sorts of things. So that is why they had the biplane. They went for the biplane. It made sense for the roles it was being accounted for. But let's go on to the consolidated PB2Y Coronado. Because if you have a brilliant PBY aircraft, and if it's really, really good, what you really want to do is turn it into a super bomber. <laughs> and let's be honest, the PB2Y Coronado was a super bomber. It is an absolute beast of an aircraft when it comes to bombing. It could carry 12,000 pounds, or that's 5.4 tons of bombs housed in the wings. <coughs> Darn near five and a half tons of bombs. That's just that's just a lot of explosive coming your way. And it had six point five M two Browning machine guns and two point five Browning machine uh, six point five Browning machine guns are mounted in twin mounts. Um, that's in the nose, dorsal, and tail. And two Browning machine guns in manual waste mounts. Interesting enough, no cannon. So frankly, the Seaford wins that battle. And also, the Seaford wins. In terms of range, because um, the the range of the Coronado was 930 nautical miles, but the Coronado has definitely won in terms of bombing power. Seaford also wins in terms of horsepower. It's quite disturbing, um, considering how great the Catalina was. You don't have the Coronado, but then you realise the Coronado is a bombing aircraft. It is for blasting the living daylights out of anyone who gets in the way of the US Navy um, from the range of its fairly copious fairly copious um, basing. Now the thing is the Royal Air Force also operates it and to be honest as they were uh, as they also had an air part asked history the operation of the Bristol Bristol we can understand it. It's not perhaps the prettiest aircraft in the world, but it is a lovely aircraft for what it has to do, and it does do a lot of work for the United States Navy. And 217 are built. They're useful. Now, the Curtis Seagull. It's ordered in 19... First flight is in 1934. It's ordered in 1933-ish time. And it's introduced in 1935, and it retires in 1945. 322 are built. They are used by the USN, the US Coast Guard, and the US Marine Corps. And they are pretty darn cool. They are the spotting aircraft flying from various positions. They're also put on various islands. They have one fixed forward firing point Three Browning M2 and a flexible rear firing point three as well. And they can carry 650 pounds of bombs. They can't carry a torpedo though. See, that's the interesting thing. The um, Swordfish float plane could also carry a torpedo if it wanted. It wasn't exactly fast getting off the water and there were all sorts of joys with it, but it could do it. But there again, the yeah, they've gone for the more streamlined center fixed float position, which does allow you to have a higher speed, perhaps explaining the cruise speed of 116 knots or uh, to 133 miles per hour. And, you know, that does help, although they still have a range of 675 nautical miles. Still pretty cool. Pretty darn cool. Japan. The Kwansky H8K. So basically, Emily here comes about because Mavis is brilliant in every single way, but the Imperial Japanese Navy wants bigger. 
yes, I am calling them by their allied returning and spotting names. And yes, it does completely take away any of their threatening nature. You realize this is the aircraft which was used to do launch a second attack on Hawaii to bomb it. And was actually one of them was shot down by a Brewster Buffalo. So honestly, we can't be quite sure about how good an idea that was. Seriously, Japan, you're sending two of them? Look up 4th of March 1942, I think it was. Let me just check. Yeah, 4th of March 1942. The second, it's the second raid on Pearl Harbor. And they use these. You just go, why? Why would you do that to the four aircraft? They're lovely. They're fine. They're great. They're brilliant reconnaissance aircraft. They have a ferry range of 3,862 nautical miles, which is mahoosive and lovely for the time period. They have decent power plants. They even apparently have the ability to carry an anti-surface radar, uh, the Model 1. They can carry around about... 4,000, uh, two tons of bombs, 4,400 pounds of bombs, depth charges, or, and torpedoes. They can carry, they have five 20 millimeter machine guns, well, let's be honest, that's pretty much a cannon, in various turrets, and they have five 7.7 .7 machine guns. So, honestly, that's a flying porcupine in comparison as well, festooned with weaponry. But it's still going up against fighters in Hawaii alone. Why? Why? Do you not like it? Did you not? Did you hear the Allied reporting name was Emily, and you not like it? Is that it? Well, the next one, as I said in the quiet video, and this is being produced because the other one's apparently too quiet. So this is the louder video. Hopefully, who knows? Nakamchi Age Six M Two N. Okay, so, someone in the Imperial Japanese Navy's Aviation Design Bureau hates people, and especially pilots. This is the only reason I can think of for this, because you take a fighter, which is designed from the get-go to be as light as anything, so it will be long-ranged and fast and nimble, and that is how it's going to win and dominate the air airways and dominate everything in battle. And you turn it into a float plane. Where there is no chance of it being nimble and fast. Absolutely zero chance. Yes, it's a good fighter. Yes, you have it available. But it is the absolute antithesis of what you've just created. Okay? Why? I know there are people who are going to come back to me and go, infrastructure, it's the fighter they're already building, it makes sense, da 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 it's the best fight. No, it doesn't. Because the moment you look at it with any kind of logical head, you think, why would I do this to the pilots? And especially 327 of them, at least, because that's the number of aircraft built. It has a range a ferry range of 963 nautical miles, an actual operating range of about 620 nautical miles. That's not brilliant. 2.7, uh, two 7.7 7 machine guns firing forward, that's 0.3 inches, machine gun firing forward, and two 20 in the fuselage, and two 20 millimeter machine guns, again, in the Japanese uh, lexicon cannon, and everyone else's in the outer wings. Why? Why? It's just... Why would you do that? You have a perfectly decent mind. They could have gone with the previous generation of fighter. There are so many fighters Japan has that they could have made sense to turn into float planes. And they take the zero. I know you're obsessed with it by this point, and by 1942, but you're just asking for a lot of them to get killed. And unsurprisingly, they do. They're supposed to be used against, um, you know, things like the Flying Fortress and bombers. and It's supposed to be an interceptor. And um, 
you know, do reconnaissance support from previous landings. Honestly, these were things which P-38 Lightnings used to love to come across. It's a zero. It's light as anything, and it cannot maneuver. Yay! It's happy hunting for the P-38s. And actually, it's interesting enough, its first day of flight was on the 7th of December, 1941. Perhaps that was a bad day for Japan. It looks so good on paper. In reality, terrible, terrible day. The, mo uh, the sun has helpfully moved around straight into my window. I wonder if I could balance it with some light from the other side. Ah, oh, well then. Who knows? I'll just look sort of Phantom of the opera -ish. Mm hmm Right then, it's the German. It's Bonn and Voss, BV-22 Viking and the BV-238. <sighs> Other than the Mars, which was the biggest one produced by the Allies and is discussed in the post-World War II um, video. These are the absolutely biggest ones produced tactically. I, you notice I have avoided the Spruce Goose. I'm avoiding the Spruce Goose until the live. And then I'm going to have to deal with the Spruce Goose. But the Viking and the single 238 are pretty much should be examined all those together. And that is what I'm going to do. They are lovely, lovely aircraft for the Germans in terms of supplies. The you know, uh, frankly, the BV two two eight two 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 is critical for supplying Norway operations because again, you're talking about a place which has minimal airfields, minimal safe places to land. So what does it have? A lot of water, a humongous amount of water. I know, let's use the humongous flying boats we have to resupply them, and they work. They're also used for long-range anti-summary warfare patrols and all sorts of things. Well, not anti-summary warfare, long-range. Actually, in the Germans' case, they actually were used occasionally for anti-summary warfare. They did try and attack Allied submarines. They also occasionally ended up attacking their own submarines by mistake. But leaving that to one point... They are also used for long-range maritime patrols to try and help their submarines. So it's long-range, we'll call it maritime reconnaissance, but I want to call it long-range maritime su uh, submarine support. And they even occasionally did things like, um, I think one was used to fly out and pick up someone who was ill and so something like that. But they did, they could carry um, 72 stretchers or 92 passengers. So, you know, that's quite cool. And they were considered, I think, for the Japan flights. I'm not sure if anyone actually did it. Um, possibly. Possibly. But I don't think anyone actually did it in the BV-222. They had a ferry range of 3,300 nautical miles, which made them suitable for the flights to Japan. And endurance of 28 hours at sea level. The interesting thing I've gone through is I have been looking to see if they had a toilet aboard. I'm hoping they did. I haven't managed to find any notes of it about it anyway. For E 20mm cannon, one in the forward turret, one each in the forward turrets and the two wing turrets. And five 30mm machine guns. Um, there are four apparently in, a beam, in beam positions. They're not quite as flying porcupines as the Sunderland or the Quaskies. Um, basically, Short and Sunderland, uh, Short and Quasky seem to be far more obsessed with defensive firepower than their German counterparts. But they're cool. They are cool. Now, the 238 is pretty much the answer to the question of. I want to make a V weapon, but, but it's going to be a. Um, it, it's got to be a flying boat because they could, in theory, and there's only one built, and it's thankful for London that only one was built, um, they could carry.
Sorry, more books arrived. Periscope Patrol, The Saga of Multiple Submarines by John Frey Turner, and Brassie's Naval Annual, 1949. Do not ask me how much this book cost. 1939 one costs even, uh, cost even more. But, completely off topic, it does have a great picture of the um, new Russian battleship of the Sudras class, as she'll appear when complete in there. So, we talk about Russian battleships these days as being something which was completely um, stupid, silly. But honestly, it was something legitimate. We'll explore more at some point in the future. I will do a look into sort of post-World War II battleships and why it wasn't so silly. Right then, anyway, back to the bomb on Voss 238, which I think I was most of the way through explaining about. Um, yes, the, the other interesting thing is they could, of course, carry 20 250-kilogram bombs in wing bomb bays and four 1,000-kilogram, um, that's one ton, bombs on external racks, or two 1.2-ton uh, two torpedoes on external racks, or four Heinchel HS-293 missiles on the external racks. Are you getting this? External racks are quite useful here. Um, at, or two 1-ton BV-143 glide bombs on external racks. Woo! That is a lot of hurt coming your way. Admittedly, it's in a massive, great big target, but it's a lot of hurt coming your way. Uh, let's be honest, it's the idea is pretty much they're building a 238 is long range anti convoy work because it wouldn't really work in attacking a normal task force, but attacking a convoy, which may or may not have an escort carrier with it, that could work. Could do. Why not? But it could do. So, German rescue, search and rescue. Ah, the Rettingsboy, or Rescue Boy. Both the Allies and the Germans came, used these, or used similar things. And there is actually a movie, famously, where a Lancaster crew ends up in one. They have roughly four beds. I have heard ones of version of six beds. And I've heard of some which, the Allied ones, which were based on boat hulls, which were turned into yachts post-World War II. Um, they are really quite a cool idea. And the whole point is that they, your air crews could make it to the one of them, get in, send off a signal, and would have enough power, thanks to batteries and various other things in there, and lights and food and <coughs> medical facilities, to sort of warm themselves up and wait until the flying boat would arrive to pick them up, your search and rescue system. Which is a pretty cool idea. It also, in a way, shows how limited German surface action, surface vessels were in their operations in the channel, channel. Because if you consider, whilst the British did do a few of these, they were mostly in the North Sea for bombing crews which were coming back from raids over Germany. For the channel, they were mainly relying upon their own boats, which would pop out and pick other search and rescue craft, which would pop out and pick people up when you know they alerted they were going down. It shows how much, in a nice way, the British had achieved at least a psychological dominance, a dominance of small boat actions in the channel. I know the traditional myth is based around the e-boats being amazing and supreme and all these things. Well, the reality is e-boats weren't being used, or Chanel boats, I suppose technically that's what they should be um, weren't being used to pick up people from these Redders and Bowls, or these rescue boys, unless they were absolutely close by already. It was flying boats. Because that was a far safer recovery method. Far less likely to be intercepted by the Allies. But they are pretty cool. There are also rumours that there's one still out there somewhere in the water bobbing, but I think that's probably just a myth. 
historians have. It's kind of like finding the Holy Grail, finding an inter, a, a intact rescue boy, and you know being able to board it and examine it for all the history inside. I, I don't think it really exists, but it's a nice myth to have. Historians do like. Let's be honest. Historians mostly did watch Indiana Jones as children and many of them are obsessed with actually becoming that sort of thing and the reason they don't is because they realize that most of archaeology is digging around in a lot of dirt and wet and rain but they still have the dream of discovering something so you know the ones who they all still have that dream of finding something hence the rescue boy myth but there's one still out there somewhere <laughs> undiscovered since World War II. I'm sure in the busiest shipping lane in the world, arguably the channel, that is that is likely that there is one bobbing out there that no one has noticed in like 80 years. <sighs> Maybe. Anyway, it could be an RC. Ah, the Fiat RS-14. Now, this is a cool aircraft. Come on, it looks cool. You can, it's designed with an Italian flair. It's also got an Italian flair for engineering, but uh, engineers, but we'll leave that to one side. Um, it's sort of first flight is in 1939, but it takes till 1941 before it's introduced. Arguably the pressures of war. It's got, um, it's, Free machine guns with armament, and it can carry up to 400 kilograms or 880 pounds worth of bombs. It's got a crew of three, and it is very much your reconnaissance aircraft. It's not gonna do it, it's about reconnaissance, occasionally, movement of high value um, <clears throat> people. Because if you look up, it's got space inside that it can move people, not many. But a few. Um, I think it used to be about five or six passengers. And it was used a lot for providing communication, providing reconnaissance over the Mediterranean, where its range of. I think its range was um, about one. Hang on, I worked this out. Not. Sorry, I was checking my maths. About 1,350, give or take a bit, nautical miles. It's a fairly good range for the Mediterranean. Because you think about it, you can go out about 600 miles, do a couple hundred miles of search, and can't fly back home. Um, or you can just cross from one side to the other if you have air bases on the other side. Doing your, re your search on the way. It's, it, it's viable as a Mediterranean rec a reconnaissance tool. It's a good aircraft as well. Right then, so what have we got coming up? N button work, please. <laughs> Sorry, it's using this left-handed. Um, Thursday, 9th of July, flying boats and seaplanes. Well, that's today. Woohoo! And I'm actually recording this this morning, but I will not be wearing this one later. I will be wearing one of my T-shirts. Um, unfortunately, the new T-shirts I've ordered haven't arrived. The books have started arriving, but the new T-shirts haven't. They're very cool books, though. Brassies, the native animal. Uh, Navy Vernal, edited by Rear Admiral H.G. Fursfield. Basically, the, um, uh, you know, as I was sort of treated, teach it almost the American version of um, James, but it is cute. It's very cool, and it's got some beautiful pictures in it. It's got Battle Class. There you go. Battle Class Destroyers. Picture of a couple of them sitting there. Looks like they were under construction, having their turbines fitted. Hmm? Cool. Yeah, I'm going to enjoy going through this. And 
an invasion drone. Come on. A radio-controlled amphibious salamander carrying 1,200 pounds of explosive designed for clearing beach obstacles. Yeah. You all sit there and go, unmanned warfare, it's the newest hotness. <laughs> yeah. It's neither new nor the hotness. It's good, but it's not new. Right then, and uh, what have we got coming up after that? We've got Naval Diplomacy. Well, hey, I like Naval Diplomacy. It's fun. I get to have conversations. Some more admirals. Before that, oh, we've then got the next patron video, which is the CIA's Royal Navy Operations in the Indian Ocean from 1941 to 43. And it's Thursday, 23rd of July from the sea, Korea Indonesian confrontation. Uh, Thursday, 20th of July, uh, making Mare Nostrum a hollow jest, RN submarines. Can't think why books like this are suddenly being added quickly to my um, bookshelves, you know, in, to broaden out the submarine ones I already have. Yay! Periscope Patrol. The Saga of the Malta Force Submarines. Mainly because I found that my submarine books were all focused on the Pacific War and the RN's involvement out there, and some on the Atlantic, and I didn't have many on the Italian, on the Mediterranean. It's quite fun. I wanted to do it, and then I went, uh, ooh, reason to buy more books. And pre tribals, the RN's destroy force before the great, the wonderful tribal class came to be. Or bless the tribals. They were good ships. And yes, I've written a book about them, Battle and Daring Class. So if you haven't, there is a link somewhere around here which takes you to the book. Go look at it. Maybe buy one. <laughs> Joke, it's pre order at the moment. And if you do, that's lovely. But if you don't, keep watching the videos. I hope you, I hope you enjoy them. Where else to find me? Twitter, Patreon, and Global Maritime History. Patreon is critical because that is how I managed to afford my books. At the moment, I'm an early career researcher, and honestly, we aren't paid the most at the best of the times. And the moment the university has a chance to go with a contract, go, ah, we can save money. We don't need you guys. They do. Hence, I've gone down from about uh, a good couple of universities um, that I usually work for, and sometimes as many as four or five universities I occasionally do some wandering around for. Um, Various methods of paying. Some it's paying in kind. But you know, that's what we accept. Uh, will you turn up and do a bit of lecture? In return, we'll give you accommodation for a couple of days so you can do some research in their archives. Yeah, I'll do that. Um, has gone down to one. So, you know, finances are kind of. Books are now in, all these things are going well, life is good. And I can still afford books because I've got the very nice patrons. So, hey, thank you. And I'm still getting to a lot of teaching because I've started, I've grown this YouTube channel and something, and I've somehow got 4,000 odd subscribers. So, thank you. Thank you very much to everyone. Right. And there will be some articles appearing on the Globe Maritime History Show soon. Uh, now the book's done, I can devote some time to writing some small articles and there will be an edited work a volume which I'm taking part in with my girlfriend for the Falklands War based on the conference we organized together on that. So that's all gonna be fun. Right then and this is going to officially be 10 minutes longer than apparently according to the advertisements on um, YouTube that discuss the analyst that comes on YouTube that on the channel tells me that my perfect video should be. My perfect video should apparently be 35 minutes of these ones. The live ones they recommend to be about three hours. The um, recorded ones 35 minutes. Ah, ah, well. I hope you enjoyed it and I hope you found it interesting and I hope you're here for the live later today. That's um, six o'clock in the afternoon British, uh, sound, uh, British summertime. So thank you. Thank you very much again to all my subscribers. Thank you to very much to my patrons. Thank you to everyone who watches me. Thank you to everyone who has pre-ordered a book. Thank you to everyone. Basically, you've, you've made this wonderful. I, I'm sheltering with two people who are shielding, and this has been made it work. Made it a lot more fun. Take care, and I say.
Um, see you soon, hopefully.